Hey, what's up, Cloudways fans? Good to see you for another live prepathon session. We're hanging out today with Rand Fishkin. He's going to be presenting on ways to not just serve demand, but actually create demand out there in the marketplace and deliver tons of value. If you don't yet know who Rand Fishkin is, you're in for a treat today. He is CEO and founder of SparkToro. They uh, are makers of a very, very fine an amazing audience research platform. They've got over 1,500 customers using that platform between marketers, agencies, uh, and consultants. They've got over 75,000 people that are um, using the platform in some way, and they're crawling over 150 million unique profiles to create these audience maps uh, for folks to use in their system. So we're really excited to welcome Rand Fishkin to our Cloudways Black Friday Cyber Monday Prepathon. As you know, over the last couple of weeks, we've been helping you prepare your business so that you can have your biggest ever Black Friday and Cyber Monday. And of course, we've got some amazing deals coming up from the Cloudways team. Stay tuned for more info on that later. Rand, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me, Brent. Great to be here. So Rand, uh, yeah, excited to have you on the, on the platform today. If uh, folks have questions for Rand as we're going through today's presentation, please throw them into chat. We'll get them queued up for the Q&A, the last part of the, today's session. Um, but Rand, are you ready to, to dive in and uh, share your, your presentation? Absolutely. Let's do it. All right. Wonderful. All right. Well, Brent and, uh, and everyone at the Cloudways team, thank you so much for having me. And uh, yeah, let's uh, let's get started. So this this is my my general position, right? That uh, for for folks who might not know my background, I started uh, another company before SparkToro, also a software business called Moz, um, and Moz was of course in SEO software. SEO was something I did professionally for seventeen years, so long long time uh, between two thousand one and, and twenty eighteen, and. SEO, search engine optimization, is all about serving existing demand, right? Somebody comes to a search. Here, I'll show you. I'll show you, right? You're, you've got these, these marketing strategy options. So somebody comes to Google and they search for a Japanese rice donabe. A donabe is like a, it's a rice cooker. It's a clay pot um, from a particular region in Japan. And they, they make these uh, really super cool, um, beautiful pots, but very sensitive. <laughs> I got one and it's like, you know, you have to clean it just so you got to heat it up just so it's uh, it's a little particular, but it, it, it does make beautiful rice. And someone could could find out about that and then come to Google. And of course, if you ranked in the top results or you bought a paid ad, whatever, you could attract demand that already existed for rice donabes and sell someone that donabe. The second option is that you go and you create awareness that leads to demand. So many of you listening to me, unless you know, you're know you all into Japanese cuisine, might not even be familiar with donabes. In fact, I was not familiar with donabes, but during the uh, you know lockdown parts of the pandemic, I got this uh, email in my inbox from Taste, which I've been subscribed to for a long time, and I really like them. And, and you know, donabe isn't just a pot, it's an experience. When you read this article, I guarantee, you know, if you're into this kind of stuff, you will be sold. It'd be like, huh. Oh, I should put that on my list. I want to get one of those. And since I wasn't spending money on a whole lot else because there wasn't much to do, I, of course, ordered myself <laughs> a Donabe. So that article created demand. Uh, and it was really created by the, the, the owner of a particular uh, website who writes recipe books about how to cook with Donabes. And, you know, she's been featured in all these places, including Taste, right? So she's creating awareness that leads to demand. Now, the, the two kinds of tactics, right? M most marketing channels and tactics fall into one group or the other. Some overlap. I'll show you what I mean. Like most SEO branded keywords, right? For your particular brand or unbranded keywords. Most paid search and PPC is like this. Most conversion rate optimization, definitely. Most comparison marketing, absolutely, right? Getting on, on lists of providers, right? So if you're trying to kind of, hey, I want to be in the holiday gift guide this year, right? Essentially, that that sort of serving existing demand could ver verge on new demand. Most social media marketing is creating new demand, right? It's people who weren't previously aware or didn't know they wanted this thing or maybe were thinking about it, but social media nudged them. Most content marketing that is not for search. So I say content marketing, but really any content marketing that's directed at ranking in search engines, that's going to be serving existing demand. 
versus creating new. Most email marketing is creating new demand. Uh, some can be serving existing trade shows, direct sales, account-based marketing, freemium, uh, free tools, right? All that kind of stuff. And then some activities that straddle both. So retargeting, sure, sponsorships, brand marketing, right? Straddles both of these lines. And I'm not, I'm not going to tell you that you shouldn't invest or one or the other, but I am going to say this. Most marketers that I know over the last 20 years have shifted from creating new demand, which was virtually all 20th century marketing, to serving existing demand. And I, and I think us digital marketers maybe have forgotten the power of creating new demand. So I'll show you a couple examples here. Uh, I think that, that can be helpful. So this is Izon's business aviation software platform. Hmm. And you know the, the Izon tech platform, it's <laughs> um, very particular for people in the aviation business and logistics side of the field. It's, it's a niche in B2B. You know, maybe you have a few thousand buyers total, right? Airlines, logistics companies, maybe makers of planes, that kind of stuff. Not a whole lot else. If you go into Google Trends and you look for any of the terms around what Izon does, so business aviation software, or it, it's um, that the contraction is, is BizAV, right? That's what folks in the business call it. Business, business aviation technology, aviation fleet software, business flight plan software. There's nothing. Like not, not one of these has enough demand to show anything. But I'm going to show you SparkToro because, um, I don't know, the founder gave me free access. Uh, so it, this is showing us essentially what people who are in the business aviation world, right? They, they have business aviation in their profile or, or BizAv or something like that. This is what they follow, engage with, read, listen to, watch, subscribe to. There's a lot here, right? A, a, a tremendous percent of the people who are in the business aviation world, you know, subscribe to or engage with Aviation Week or, or Cessna or GA News or Cutter Aviation, AIN Online, um, eBase Aero. I, I don't actually know any of these publications. I, I'm, I'm not sure what any of them is. I've, I've heard of uh, Cessna like the plane, but I don't, I don't know about, much else about it. And this is essentially how eyes on the, the, the software, right? The, the business aviation software, this is how they did all their marketing. They didn't necessarily, they weren't trying to serve existing demand. They were trying to create new demand. So they were getting into all of these sources of influence, the Runway Girl Network, uh, AI and Online, Aerospace Manufacturing Design Magazine. You can see Flight Global and Aviation Week and Corporate Jet Investor, which all of which were on that that page, right? That showed what they subscribe to. There you go, right? This is essentially, this is a phenomenal way to market just the same way that the Japanese rice donabe got into the publication Taste that I read and essentially created the demand for me to buy a donabe. My assumption is that when Collins launched this, you know, eyes on software platform and they, they had you know, headlines like Collins launches eyes on easy button for biz av operators. Man, that's, that's, that's a freaking hard headline to beat. Like that's, that's some good demand creation there. Uh, and my understanding is they had quite a bit of success with that. Here's a B2C example. <laughs> um, so this is my wife, Geraldine and, uh, and Geraldine is a James Beard award-winning food writer, um, who <laughs> at my, <laughs> uh, also, uh, recently, I think this summer, wrote a blog post that did very well, was very popular, uh, where she tried every flavor of what used to be called Mountain Dew and is now, I think, Mitten Dew. I'm not sure how they want us to pronounce that exactly, but here she is in a Florida convenience store, one of the only places that you can acquire the unique purple thunder Mitten Dew uh, flavor. And, and Mountain Dew their sales are growing, right? They've been doing pretty darn well uh, over the past few years. And most of that, most of that growth and uh, keeping up with the industry has been launching unique products. And the, the, the product marketing that they do, you don't see it in search, right? I searched for buy Mountain Dew, buy new flavors of Mountain Dew, uh, Mountain Dew new flavors, buy Mountain Dew major melon, the worst tasting beverage ever. <laughs> Uh, they do. I did try most of them. They, they do taste horrifying, but interesting, horrifying. Yes. Yes. Mutton. <laughs> uh, 
But brand demand for Matindu itself over the last few years has risen dramatically. And this is down to product marketing. Mountain Dew has essentially identified these are our target customers. This is what interests them. When we release new flavors and we build this brand fandom around what we do, these people go search it out. It becomes part of their sort of you know identity. They're like, oh, I, I tried this flavor. Did you try this flavor? Have you tried this one? That kind of thing. There's lots of online discussion around it and social media that happens around it. Uh, and they use this as their brand marketing thing. They get coverage in the news every time they launch a new flavor and you know which store do they promote it with. They, they built this outpost uh, in the mountains of Tennessee, which is which is where Mountain Dew is originally from. And now you can go hike and do archery and try lots of soda flavors uh, out there. So uh, B2B and B2C, this, this process can work for both, right? And a way that I like to think about this, a way that I think uh, many, many folks um, do this is, is with a something called the influence map mindset. So influ an influence map is a visual framework. It comes from the world of behavioral psychology and it's uh, similar to a customer journey, but not, not quite the same thing, right? It's essentially a mental model that you can construct to help understand where can I influence my audience in the ways that I want to. So let's, let's, let's take a look here, right? So es essentially, if you think of that classic customer journey, right? It's, I discover I have a problem, I'm thirsty, or I need software to make business aviation management easier. You grow, you gain brand awareness around that, right? You're like, oh, okay, well, now I've learned what software, you know, or what soft drinks are available or what software is available in the spaces I'm looking at. And then I educate myself about them and then I seek out a solution. And this obviously varies depending on, on who you are and what you do, but there's this like, um, different ways that you can influence, you as a marketer can influence people along different steps of this. And the opportunities, the channels and tactics in particular that you might use to do this are different because what people pay attention to at each of these different steps is different, right? If someone's in solution seeking phase and they're searching for, you know, um, business aviation software uh, comparison, that's fundamentally very different than people who are in the problem discovery phase and they're sort of just paying attention to the news and haven't even uh, heard of business aviation software. They don't even know what's available. They haven't considered it yet, et cetera, right? So your marketing should be very different depending on which one you wanna influence. The job that we have as marketers is fundamentally to target the right audience in the right places with the right message, right? And so if what I really need to do is influence people at problem discovery phase, I need to get people aware of my brand, I, which which is true, right? SparkToro is only, what, two and a half years old. Tons of people in the marketing space have never heard of SparkToro. In fact, I would say probably 95% of marketers have never heard of SparkToro. So, uh, and, and it doesn't even matter. They, they haven't even heard of the problem that SparkToro solves, right? They don't even think about Hey, how do I get audience research and figure out what percent of, you know, my audience pays attention to different publications or whatever? So our our challenge is not further education or solution seeking. Our challenge is problem discovery and brand awareness, primarily, right? First and foremost. And so I don't want to go over invest in the channels and tactics that are influencing people further down the journey. I want to make sure that I'm in the right place. Um, one of the ways that you can potentially do this and try and like sort out in your own mind and prove to yourself and your team, where are we as an organization is to look at uh, search volume, right? So branded versus unbranded search might, might help this. I'll, I'll show you an example. So this is, I'm using Google trends here, which is totally free. And looking at Airbnb and vacation rentals. So see the red line, that's, that's vacation rentals, the blue line, that's uh, Airbnb. And what Google is showing us is essentially worldwide, all search categories, uh, demand, rough demand, right? Search demand. So in 2009, Airbnb was an unknown brand, right? In the vacation rental space. Like maybe some people had heard of VRBO. Maybe some people hadn't even checked out vacation rentals yet. But what Airbnb needed to do was rank well for vacation rentals. They needed to serve the existing demand 
get people from that market to pay attention to them. By 2013, they had actually passed the vacation rentals market. Airbnb was bigger than all vacation rentals searches. So probably what they needed to do was move from brand awareness back up the funnel to problem discovery, right? They needed more people to think, I'm traveling somewhere. I could stay at a hotel, but there's this other option that I previously might not have considered. And if you looked at Airbnb's marketing back then, you would have seen that that's exactly what they did is they tried to invest in the idea, the very idea of staying at someone's house, of buying a house to rent it out to people for short-term vacation rentals, right? That whole market. Today, right, in 2022, what's what's Airbnb's opportunity? It's, it's probably actually further education and solution seeking. Almost everyone already knows what Airbnb is. They already have an idea of whether they want a vacation rental or a hotel. It's really today about how do we educate people into being convinced that a vacation rental is a better option than a hotel? And how do we get them from consideration to solution seeking? Like let's convert more people. So you could see Airbnb uh, recently, I think last year, investing a whole bunch in um, showing the Wi-Fi speed, high-speed Wi-Fi of the vacation properties, right? Of, of properties in their listings. So that for a lot of travelers who were no longer going purely for vacation, they were sort of thinking about it as a working vacation or a remote work situation. They needed to know, hey, am I going to have a good internet connection here? And so Airbnb started to verify that in the listings, which I think a very good idea, great way to get people from further education to solution seeking and conversion. So uh, what, what we have to do is align our tactics and channels, right? So problem discovery would be like, um, let's figure out what keywords people are searching for in here. Let's figure out what their... Uh, being shown in their Google Discover feeds or their Reddit feeds or their Google News feeds, their Apple News feeds, whatever they're paying attention to and consuming, right? We're, we're doing like category creation style advertising. Uh, probably on social networks, I would advise sort of a combination of education and entertainment, right? We're trying to build that, um, build that brand through those. When it comes to brand awareness, it's looking at things like, hey, are people searching for our competitors' keywords, and could we get our brand ranking in front of them? Are they? Uh, are we doing things that could get us sort of PR and social and viral styles of coverage, or should we be reaching out to industry-specific media, right? Which is which is exactly what what uh, Collins did with Eyes On brand advertising, viral potential. I won't go through all of these, but you get the idea, right? That there's there's different ones for each different thing. Uh, Brent, I think you and the team are going to uh, send around this presentation so that everybody's got a copy of it. Um, so you'll have it. But I thought I might talk through if if I've convinced you, if you're like, "Ooh, yeah, Rand, I like I like this idea of creating demand, not just serving existing demand. I think we should invest some marketing effort there. Let me show you my favorite demand creation strategy, like the, the way I like to play this and the way I've you know, built up demand for SparkToro, which is in this this weird space that that nobody was really playing in, in before, didn't really exist. So I, I mentioned Taste Magazine before, online magazine, but uh, so I get this email in my inbox, much like I got the Donabe one. Salsa Macha's big moment to crunch. Mexico's fiery condiment for empanadas and tostadas is right at home and sandwiches, soups, and definitely pizza. Oh my God. Friends, I'm sold. I'm hungry. <laughs> I want to get some. In fact, much like I do a lot of the time when Taste emails me, like I know when I see their email in my inbox, I'm like, ah, I'm going to end up buying something, aren't I? Why? Why did I do that? Well, because I've subscribed to Taste for a few years. So I'm familiar with them, right? I know this publication. And I like their uh, suggestions, right? I, I subscribe specifically to learn about products like this. The past recommendations that they've sent me have been solid. The Donabe, I use it literally once a week at least. So I, I trust them. I have come to trust them. And they have no vested interest, right? They're not including affiliate links here. Even if they did, it, it would be fine, right? I, I have learned to trust their recommendations. And they're impartial about it, right? They don't suggest something just because they own it. And this is already in my inbox. 
So it's quickly available. I'm already subscribed to it. I don't have to get someone to subscribe and then learn to trust me and then learn to like me and then and follow me. I'm, I'm, they're right there. So this is my, my general position, right? Which is publications, people, podcasts, video creators, social accounts, whatever, that match these criteria. They're familiar to your audience. They are liked by your audience. They are trusted. They are perceived as impartial and they are easily available, already followed by them. These are the best marketing opportunities, full stop. That's what I believe. I, I don't think you can do better than these ones. There's criteria I, I really just don't care that much about. I know a lot of us in digital marketing have been sort of trained to think about these things, but I ignore them these days. Social media followers, I don't care. Third party estimates of traffic, sorry, meh. Domain authority, I know I created it when I was at Moz, but I still don't care about it. Where they rank in Google's results, like IDGAF, which of course the acronym stands for, I don't gamble against fallacious metrics. Neither should you. So I think an editorial endorsement from a publication that reaches your audience, a high percent of your audience already is the most valuable marketing that you can do. Absolutely it is when it comes to brand awareness, problem discovery, uh, either even solution seeking, whether it gets all the way to conversion, I think that, that part is up to you. So how do you uncover the influential sources in your field? What are, what are we gonna do? Well, uh, I'll show you some examples from uh, fr from what we've got inside SparkToro, but you, you can do this on your own. Like you you can use the free version of SparkToro. You can, you can do this research by surveying and interviewing your customers. Uh, you can do this research with, you know, e even just Googling around and, and looking at what a bunch of social profiles in your audience set follows. You could, you could uh, do a bunch of LinkedIn searches, see what all the folks uh, in your network, what groups they're part of and what they pay attention to, right? But I'll show you in SparkToro just because it's easy. So here's, let's say I wanted to reach privacy advocates, which is a very, very specific portion of the online world, right? They're, they're sort of these people who describe themselves as privacy advocates and they tend to be um, authors and writers and bloggers and uh, part of NGOs or, or influencing governments around privacy issues, um, you know, pressuring private corporations to do certain things. So if I wanted to sell them a product or make them aware of a product, right? Maybe I'm working at Mastodon, for example, which we'll, we'll probably talk about <laughs> um, in the uh, in the Q and A. And and so I'm trying to get folks to switch from Twitter to to Mastodon. Well, 518 profiles with the word privacy advocate. I'm sure there's probably more like five to ten thousand privacy advocates, but SparkToro has specific public data on these 518 people across. Uh, you know, the 10 social networks that we cover. 11% shared or engaged with threat post in the past quarter. Hmm. That's a that's a darn good number. That probably means that if I had to guess, I'd say of the 10,000 privacy advocates that are that there probably are in the world, probably 10% plus engage, follow, threat post. I bet a bunch of them are subscribed to their email newsletter and they read their website and they follow them on LinkedIn and Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and YouTube and they go to their events. Cool. So once I know even one website or publication that my audience reads, watches, follows, I can go to something like Similar Web and plug in. Here, I, I plugged in Threat Post. This is free, by the way, T totally free. Plugged in Threat Post. And what Similar Web is doing is it's using its 100 million, uh, you know, clickstream um, uh, users, right? They, they, they track all the websites that these people visit. They opt into to being followed around the web. And then, man, Krebs on security, Security Week, scmagazine.com, thehackernews.com, uh, net-security.com. These, these are gold. This is These are all the places I want to be, right? I, I can I, I can do the same in SparkToro, right? And see, oh, in fact, there's a lot of overlap, right? These are visited by and followed by a lot of the same people. And so, if I've had success in one of these places, I can plug them in here. Social accounts, same thing, right? I basically find one uh, account, let's say Brian Krebs here, who's an independent investigative journalist who covers cyber, cyber crime security and privacy. Fantastic. He's also an author. So 
very influential in this field. Great. Let's uh, let's take him. Well, when we visit his Twitter profile, I see other people who are also followed by him, right? Just on the sidebar there. I can go to LinkedIn and I can see other investigative journalists and authors and reporters who are in the cybersecurity and privacy advocacy fields. I can go to SparkToro and I can see you know, a bunch of these similar people. In fact, there's a lot, a lot of matchup, right? Troy Hunt and uh, Miko and Nicole are, are in uh, two of these. Podcasts, same thing. I, um, you know, I plugged in here, Privacy Advocate again, and wow, hey, the Thread, Threat Post podcast. I should try to be a guest on that podcast. I should see if they take sponsorship on that podcast. I should see if I could get another guest who's on that podcast to mention our brand. Maybe I could get some familiarity among people who Threat Post is, is likely to invite onto their podcast or who are upcoming guests that I can see in the next six months. YouTube channels, right? That, same same story here, right? I'm trying to get into these places. Or alternatively, I could just advertise, right? I could say, hey, these websites, these social accounts, these YouTube channels, I want my targeted advertising to reach people who follow those accounts. Um, and in fact, lots of marketers do this. The, the trouble is just that frustratingly, like you know, after the Cambridge Analytica scandal, Facebook and Google took away a bunch of the controls that let you do this yourself, right? And so now it's kind of a, you know, their motto is like, trust us, we'll target the right people for you. You know, you don't have to worry about getting in front of them. And I don't buy that for a second. I think you're going to have way more value. In fact, I've talked to lots of marketers who have way more value independently selecting the publications, people, social accounts, YouTube channels, websites, whatever, and doing their advertising in a more targeted fashion. Uh, some other tools to try. Syed, you, you just asked this question, so so great. Uh, this is Buzzsumo, which I'm a subscriber to. I really love their alerts um, for showing me sort of who's covering my space in particular. Uh, hmm. Excuse me, this is, um, what you call it? Uh, Buzzsumo's owner, Brandwatch, uh, which is a, a great tool. Uh, this is, um, audience, uh, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that correctly, but it's, it's audience with an S and it does some similar things to what SparkToro does. So can show you kind of, you know, here's people who are interested in the LA Clippers and here's other affinities that they have and things that they talk about. Okay. <laughs> Whenever I present this, they're like, you know, some marketers go, wait a minute, wait a minute. So I have been, you know, basically setting up a Google uh, ads account, setting up a, uh, my Facebook ads account, setting up my whatever Reddit or Twitter or LinkedIn or uh, TikTok ads account. And with them, I just kind of build a little campaign and then then like they show it to the right people. This, this whole process, Rand, of like figuring out what my audience pays attention to and trying to pitch them, trying to get coverage over time, like that seems really hard. Could I just, couldn't I just outsource this to Google and Facebook? Yes, you can. You absolutely can. Let me just let me just walk through a few stories that make me concerned about whether Facebook and Google and, and in e-commerce, Amazon have your best interests at heart, right? So a lot of these stories, right? Like Procter and Gamble cutting hundreds of millions of dollars in spend, Chase cutting millions of dollars in spend, uh, Uber wasting a hundred million dollars, uh, eBay wasting millions and millions of dollars, right? When all of these Folks, and, and tons more, um, there's a bunch more stories. If you follow me on LinkedIn, I, I occasionally post about them. But all these folks like spend a tremendous amount on advertising. They pull back their advertising and they get better results. How could it be that pulling back on your Google ads could get you more customers or more effectiveness? Like, shouldn't it be shown to less people and therefore less effective? I, I don't understand. Here's, here's Brian Chesky from Airbnb, the example we were talking about before, right? They, they can take marketing down to zero and still have 95% of the same traffic. And, and you can see this in their results, right? They essentially pulled pulled all their, their, their paid performance spending and they still saw incredible amounts of demand. Now, now right, uh, in, the, in the latest earnings report, just a few days ago, Airbnb said, we are taking all of our focus off of search you know, ranking in search engines, ranking in Google, getting search traffic and putting it into brand because we believe there's better opportunity in brand demand creation. Hey man, I, 
I think Airbnb is probably right. I think that is the right move for them. I'm not saying that the SEO stuff hasn't helped them over time. I think it absolutely did in the time where it was the most appropriate thing for them to do. And I have a story that I like to, uh, a parable that um, uh, is, has been going around the marketing world for, for a decade or two, but I, I love it. I thought I'd tell it to you anyway. So it's the, the parable of the pizzeria. Here we go. So the story goes, I'll, I'll try and tell the short version here since I, I know we're running short on time. So the, the story goes, pizzeria owner in Milan, she's like, uh, hey, I want to get more business going. So she hires three neighborhood scamps. She's got, um, <laughs> she's got, you know, a, a green flyer, a red flyer and a white flyer with discount codes on them. So she can, she can track what's happening. She hands them out to the scamps. She tells these, these neighborhood kids, Hey, go run around the neighborhood, distribute these to all the people. So she checks at the end of the month and the kid with the green flyer, who, oh my God, like half the people who are coming in and buying pizza are using this kid's green flyer. This is incredible. So she's, she fires the other two kids. She's like, keep doing what you're doing. You're bringing in so much business. I love it. This is great. Six months later, she talks to her accountant. Her accountant's like, well, yeah, you're selling more pizzas, you know, business up like 10, 15%. But because of the discount, you're actually not making much more revenue. I, I think we're actually going to be a little lower than we were, you know, in the first half of the year. And the pizzeria owner is like, how is, how is this possible? What's going on? So what does she do? She puts on a trench coat, a hat, a disguise. She follows the kid. She sees, oh, look at this. Where, where's this kid going to go? So he he grabs his green flyers. He walks out of the pizzeria. He ducks into an alleyway around the corner from the pizzeria. And then he watches. And anybody who's going, looking like they're walking toward the pizzeria, he jumps out and hands them the flyer. Because why work hard to make more sales when you could just take credit for the sales that were already going to happen. This is Google and Facebook's motto. This is how they make more money, right? The, the, yes, yes, it is true that some demand creation happens from the ads that you see on these platforms, but a tremendous amount of the conversions, the sales that would take that are uh, attributed to advertising because someone saw a view through conversion or or Google or Facebook showed your ad to them, they would have found you anyway. That's 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 just the way it is. And I, I think that by doing your own research, whether you use SparkToro or Audience or, or, or Brandwatch uh, or Helixa.ai or similar web or whatever, whatever, you know, surveys and interviews, calling up your customers, looking at, at where they came from in your analytics report from organic and then plugging those channels into those places and finding the places your audience pays attention and being present in those places. That is how you reach beyond the duopoly uh, or an e-commerce, the triopoly. My suggestion is that a flywheel like this might work for you. You find those sources that reach your audience. You provide some unique value that earns their attention. You wow them, you bring them to your site and you turn their audience into your audience. I, I mean, not to get too meta, right? But a lot of the reason that I do a tremendous amount of, you know, webinars and podcasts and interviews and speaking at conferences and events and, you know, guest posting for people is because my goal is essentially like, hey, I will be present in the places where SparkToro's audience and customers pays attention. And hopefully I will provide unique value to them, bring them to our site and then turn their audience into our audience, right? And this, this methodology could work very well for you too. Right, so I'll show you a few examples because I, I, I'm certainly not the only person doing this. Here's some um, check my ads. This is, uh, you know, a couple of women who are Nandini Jami and, and Claire Atkin. Absolutely incredible, like mind blowing what they have built a, a brand around brand safety and advertiser protection, um, and they they sort of you know showcase the sordid underbelly of the advertising world so much so that uh, you might have seen Elon Musk tweeting that like. You know, uh, brand activists like these, uh, like these women have have like cost Twitter all of its advertising, et cetera. Like they've built such an incredible brand around this. Here's uh, this completely tiny B two B example: Rabo Research. Right, they sell data and consulting services to EU agribusinesses. So tiny little niche. And what do they do? They they guest write content and and amplify it on Packaging Europe, which is a publication that tons of people in that agribusiness world pay attention to. 
getting them in front of their exact right target. Here is American treasure, Neil Patrick Harris, um, who started up a new newsletter called Wondercade, sort of his own version of, um, oh my gosh, Goop, I think is the, 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 the example that a lot of people give, right? So he's starting this up. And so he goes to Inside Hook, which reaches a lot of bartenders and people in the alcohol field. It's a brand that already reaches the audience that he's going to be ready for. And he writes about how to mix up uh, Negronis. This, this is actually a pretty good article. And I don't know if Neil Patrick Harris actually wrote it. It doesn't matter. It gives you a sense of the kind of stuff that Wonder Kate is going to feature. He's turning their audience into his audience. Whoever did this marketing is a genius. Here's Cyber Six Skill using threat posts to do the same thing. The, the whole the idea of any of these is you want this publication, person, podcast, uh, uh, video creator, whatever, TikTok influencer, person who reaches your audience, publication that reaches your audience, event that reaches your audience. What is it you could do with them or for them that would earn you coverage? Is it an editorial? Is it being a guest on their podcast? Could you be one of their webinar speakers? Could you sponsor their email newsletter? Maybe it's just paid. Could you publish research, do research and publish it that, that they would be likely to cover? Is it maybe you run a joint survey with them or get quoted in their articles? This, this blue boxes list could go infinitely long, right? The idea is you build that value that gets them to feature you. This is essentially how SparkToro does all of our stuff. So we have, if you look at our, uh, if you look at our analytics, you will see we get almost no search traffic except for our brand name. Uh, I think we get fewer than 500 visits a month from any search from any searches that are not, um, you know, for SparkToro itself. Instead we get featured on industry podcasts. We get interviewed on popular YouTube channels. We get written about in email newsletters and blogs. And this brings uh, every day, a few hundred people come to SparkToro and they sign up for a, a free account. They use the tool. And then some of them, you know, become paid customers when they, when they find that the, Hey, we really need this value on an ongoing basis. Great. Right. It, it's a, it's a wonderful sort of way to build a flywheel, especially in the, um, if, if you're in a space where awareness and brand uh, brand marketing are key. So uh, I know probably a lot of you are doing search already. So I'll show you a, a cool trick and a side effect of this that, that works really well. Watch this. So uh, here's uh, Elon Musk a few months ago, you know, before the, before the Twitter purchase, right? And he's saying like, oh, I'm putting, I'm not going to buy it. I'm putting it on hold. You know, there's too much fake accounts and spam. Well, it turns out SparkToro, in order to build our index, we, we have to know who's a real versus fake person. And we do that by, you know, connecting up lots of profiles and using some um, machine learning on top of, you know, sp fake and spam profiles and, and uh, checking those out. So we did an analysis with another company called Farwonk, uh, which, which analyzes Twitter data as well, and found that, of all the accounts we could find that were active in the last 90 days, uh, about 20% were fake or spam. Now, this doesn't speak to whether Twitter's MDAUs, right, their, their um, uh, monetizable daily active users are spam or anything like that, but certainly suggestive and got tremendous amounts of coverage. You can see the, here's the spike in my, my BuzzSumo tracking. Uh, and just massive amounts of coverage from all sorts of publications, big and small, many that reach our target audience, almost all of them saying audience research tool SparkToro found that X percent of the accounts are blah, 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 blah. Here you go. Look at that. Hey, that's, that's super cool. We had never, never before ranked anywhere for audience research tools or audience research software. But after this publication, after this coverage, bam. That's very cool indeed. So just saying, even if you're into search, this stuff can help. Uh, you can try SparkToro for free if you want. This presentation uh, will be sent to everyone. I think, Brent, you'll make that available. And with that, yeah, let's do a few minutes of Q&A here. Awesome, Ooh, Similar man. tools to SparkToro. Yeah, the the three that I mentioned, I think, are uh, Audience with an S, Helixa.ai, and uh, Brandwatch. Brandwatch is quite expensive, but if, if you are enterprise, Brandwatch is terrific. It's sort of like the, um, you know, very, very premium version of, of what you can get in SparkToro. 
Uh, let's see here. Very nice. And I'm just going to throw back up this comment from earlier from Zach Stepik here. Uh, how do you suggest people track multi-channel marketing efforts? So the, the big attribution question, which I assume when you're talking about this type of publications and PR and content marketing and influencer marketing, that that question gets a little bit harder, right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I, I have a few recommendations on that front. Um, gosh, all right. The, the, I, I recently wrote about this topic um, with this blog post. I'll, I'll put it in the, ooh, can I put it in the comments? No, I need to put, I'll put it in the private chat and then you can share it with folks. But um, I wrote a post called how to measure hard to measure channels. And the, the, the short version here, Zach, is it is difficult. Uh, it might be so difficult to measure the lift that you get from these hard to measure channels that it's actually not even worth measuring them. Um, and instead, hopefully relying on the fact that uh, you can show lift month over month, quarter over quarter, through conversions, all that kind of stuff, right? In in broad metrics that you already track and say like, hey, this is working. I just can't attribute any of it perfectly because that's not how this type of content works. Another question here from Jen. Uh, how, uh, how big does your brand have to be in order to start seeing success when you're going through other channels, publications, et cetera? So weirdly, I actually think the smaller you are, the better these work. It, it's almost an inverse, right? So like, let's say Airbnb, I don't know, did a presentation with Cloudways. Could a few of us be more inclined, you know, who are listening to this to go check out, you know, Airbnb and uh, I don't know, maybe buy it for our next vacation? Yeah, but is that really impactful for them? Probably not. You know, if they were to go on, I don't know, one of the most popular YouTube channels, Sure, that that could make a little more sense. But to be honest, if you're very tiny, right? So SparkToro is a good example of this. Like when we have been featured even on small publications, publications that are paid attention to by only a few dozen or a few hundred marketers, we find that actually pretty often a lot of those people come and sign up and we can see it in our metrics, even if we can't attribute it, right? So if, you, if you're listening to me now, you go to SparkToro.com, you sign up for a free account. There's no way I can prove that that sign up came from you know the Cloudways event. I have to believe in it. <laughs> it's serendipitous. I think we have maybe time for one more question because I know Ran has a very packed schedule and and uh, maybe uh, one quick one here is uh, what's one thing you would recommend we do every week for growth? Ooh, I, I like this question a lot. I, I realize it's broad, but I like it a lot because the. The answer is going to be a little frustrating, but also it goes back to, so you, re you remember I showed you that flywheel, right? It was sort of like you do a marketing thing, you get people to, um, you know, you find a publication that reaches your audience, you do something with them, you turn their audience into your audience. I recommend that every marketer have a flywheel that is very focused and, and that you invest in every week. I recommend that you find that flywheel and keep consistently investing in the thing that works. It should scale in one of two ways. Either every time you do that marketing thing, whatever your investment is that that reaches your audience and gets them to you know, move along the chain of what you're trying to accomplish, either it should scale because every time you do it, it gets easier. So you have to put in less effort to get the same amount of return. Or alternatively, it takes the same amount of effort, but every time you do it, it gets a little better. So, you know, think about building up a following on Instagram or following on YouTube or uh, subscriptions to your email list. Every time you read an email newsletter, it's the same amount of work, but you have more subscribers than you did last week. So, right, essentially you're building up value each time. That's, that's kind of how this um, growth flywheel works. And that would be what I'd recommend for every marketer. That's awesome, Rand. Last question, just from the Cloudways team. Uh, what's it been like for you on the Cyber Monday, Black Friday prepathon process? How's this gone for you as a speaker? Oh, yeah, beautifully. No, you folks have been really wonderful. Um, and thank you again for having me.
Very nice. Well, Rand, it's been awesome to have you here with us. Uh, your presentation, man, I've, I've got like two pages of notes for myself. I love what you're doing at SparkToro. Uh, I think you're changing the game for marketers all over the world. And if you are interested in getting the slides, let us know in the comments. We'll hook you up with Rand's slides from today. They are totally action packed. And we have our Cloudways Black Friday Cyber Monday special offer that's going to be coming out very, very soon. So uh, next week, keep a lookout on your inbox. Keep a lookout on your social media channels. If you're looking to sign up for the best managed cloud hosting provider out there, we've got an amazing deal coming for you uh, this Black Friday Cyber Monday. So keep a lookout for that. We'll be posting about that very, very soon next week. And you can get that great Black Friday Cyber Monday deal best ever. And we hope that you're enjoying our prepathon sessions and you're preparing for an amazing Black Friday Cyber Monday season for yourself. Rand, thanks again for being here, man. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Take care. And that's it. We'll see you next time.